Where are my students at that went to camp? Where are they at? Y'all in the house today? Can I hear you? Where are you at? Any of you? They're coming, sleeping in, okay? Yeah, there's a few of you here. They usually come to the 630 service together and um, it'll come to this morning. Can I tell you something? God moved. I know you heard it from Pastor Nick, our youth pastor, but he moved so powerfully. Do you know we serve a miraculous, working, all-powerful God? Amen. Do you know that? Like, like, I think that sometimes we, just, we forget, we, we, we limit ourselves and we limit God and what he can do. Uh, let me just share you like what I, what I saw with my own eyes. So my daughter, Grace, suffers from scoliosis. Only a few of you guys know that. She actually has an S curve in her spine. She wears a back brace at night oftentimes. And about twice a week, I have to massage her back. And I'll massage around the spine because it's all tense. That's where the muscles are all tense. And She's constantly fatigued because of it, has to down because, because of it. And as you guys know, some of you that have back problems, it's just terrible. So it sucks, you know, see my daughter, you know, go through pain like that. But she's a trooper, man. She'll just still run, worship, play, all that stuff. Um, you guys, she went to camp with a crooked spine and came back with a straight spine. <laughs> like... The, like, I got medical documentation of the percentage of curvature on her spine. I rubbed this spine probably days before she left, you guys. Like, so she tells me on the phone, like, like, like I'm healed. I'm like, yes, that's amazing. But you know, I'm, I can't wait to see that spine. Come, <laughs> like, when you come home, so we see her out here and giving her a hug and stuff. And I'm like, how are you doing? And so when she comes to the house, finally get in the house, I'm like, baby, take that shirt off right now. And so she's like, she bends over and does it. And I'm like feeling the whole spine. It is straight all the way down, you guys. So I believe God is, is needless to say, moving very powerfully. I believe that God wants to break through in your life. That he does, that we do, we serve a miraculous God that does heal, that does deliver, that does set free. And, and if you're, kind of a plug here, I know Nick, Nick mentioned already, if you need that, your God can give it to you. And we believe that. We believe that. Now, I can't do it, but he can. And we can believe for it. Amen? Hey, how many of you guys are enjoying James, this series that we're doing, okay? Let's jump in. Let's jump in because we're in part three of this series. We decided to take the whole book and study this thing, man, and just extract all of the wisdom that James has. It's like the, the Proverbs of the New Testament. James, the half-brother of Jesus, has got like, like so much practical wisdom and advice. It's hard-hitting, though. It really is. A lot of it is very hard-hitting and very straightforward, and today isn't any different. Uh, we're going to go in James chapter 2. If you do have a Bible, um, you can open that up to James chapter 2. We're going to go through verse 1 through 13. That's what we're going to study. By the way, I told you last week that we had these um, Bibles that were coming in. We have these life application study Bibles, which a whole bunch of notes, study features in them. If you don't have a Bible, these are for sale. We got them at bulk price. Okay, I think they're like 25 bucks okay, for a study Bible in the Connection Center. So if you don't have one, you can grab a study Bible. We'd love for you to be equipped with the Word of God. Amen, church? Amen. Okay, all right. So let me, let me start with um, a verse in the middle of where we're going just to kind of show you where we're going and then we're gonna, we're gonna jump in and study it. James chapter two, verse eight and nine, right in the middle of it. James says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, so the royal law that he's talking about and the reason, the reason why this is called the royal law is because Jesus said, if you fulfill this one law, then all the others will fall into place. Like all you really have to focus on is this one thing and, and you will fulfill the will of God in the rest of your lives. This is the royal, the royal law found in scripture. What is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Sounds pretty, extremely hard, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, if you do that, if you fulfill that royal law, you're gonna do right, man. But if you show, what's this word? If you show favoritism, you're sinning. And you're convicted by that royal law. We're going to talk about favoritism today. The, the, the title of today's message is Don't Play Favorites. All right? So what is, what is favoritism? One translation of your Bibles, one translation, they, they translate that word as snobbery. Have you ever met a snob before? Right? They congregate often at churches. No, I'm just kidding. But you know what a, you know what a snob is? A snob is someone whose nose turns up when their eyes look down. They're, they're, it's, it's, another word for this is prejudice. 
It's partiality in some of your translations. The Greek word for this, again, your original, for those of you that are new, the New Testament was written in Greek, so we're just kind of extracting as much as we can from the text. That word favoritism in the Greek is a compound word. It's two Greek words put together. And, and the two words are to receive and face, like your face. It means, it means to, to receive someone on face value, to accept someone based upon face value. Value. Here's the working definition of favoritism we have today. Favoritism is giving preferential treatment based on superficial matters to one person or one group. How many of you have ever been affected by favoritism in this room? How many of you have ever been judged before? That's another word, right? You know have ever been judged before? The rest of you are lying in church. Okay. How many of you were the favorite, okay? You're the favorite. You must be the favorites in this place, the favorite child in there. There's a lot of different forms, right, that you can endure favoritism or be infected by favoritism. It shows up in the playground, right? Favoritism in the playground when they were picking the teams, right? I don't know. Maybe some of you were picked. You were the favorite. You were picked first, right? Okay? I was, I was very often picked first when I was younger. But as I got older, like there are these... We got sports small groups and stuff like that. Like I, I go to these basketball small groups. I'll just show up and stuff. And they're like, Pastor Jason. I'm like one of the last ones picked at these guys' group. I'm like, bro, I can ball, dude. You just, uh, I, one of my associate pastors, Pastor Robert, he was putting together a flag football team here recently. Didn't even tell me, right? Didn't even tell me. For, forget it. I only played semi-pro football, but you know, but you know. Okay, okay. Yeah, but it wasn't flag. They lost, by the way. <laughs> Preferential treatment, favoritism. We're talking about that. So it can happen on the playground. It can happen in sports. It can, it can happen in parenting. Parental favoritism, right? Where, where a parent, one or, or both parents, favors one child over the other. There was this like journal, this medical journal and, and, and counseling journal did this, you know, countrywide survey said that uh, it surveyed adults, and of the adults they surveyed, they said that only 15% of adults said they were not affected by favoritism by their parents. That 85% of parents actually display, at least in their perspective, favoritism towards one of their siblings. And, and the result of favoritism, especially parental favoritism, is extremely harmful. It is so harmful. It, it could be, it could be time spent, more time spent with one over the other, more privileges for one over the other, less discipline for one over the other. And, and the result of this is like all kinds of depression and anxiety, a, a feeling of like self-esteem and issues and rejection issues that can come from parental favoritism or workplace favoritism. How many are you familiar with that one? The politics of uh, workplace favoritism where someone is, is just favored over Another, James is actually going to talk to us about a case of favoritism in a church meeting. Favoritism in the church. And uh, we're going to study this today. Favorite in all aspects. Okay, here's what God, Romans chapter 2 verse 11 says this. For God does not show favoritism. Faith and favoritism are incompatible. You, you cannot have faith in God and have prejudice in your heart. You cannot, you, you cannot separate what you believe. You cannot separate your vertical from horizontal relationships. You cannot separate what you believe from how you behave. Okay? In fact, the way that we behave toward people indicates what we believe about God. So, so you show me how you treat other people, and I'll show you what you believe about God. How much God is active in your life. Um, so there's so much discrimination in the world. There's so much prejudice and partiality. There's so much of that. There ought to be one place where that is not tolerated in the church of the living God. It should be the place where, where all walls get broken down and every foot is level at the cross. Amen? So what's the big deal about favoritism? Why is James bringing this up? Again, we're studying this in context of James' writing. And I want to show you why. Where, where is he going here now in bringing up this, this topic? What's the big deal about favoritism, James? There's three things I want to point out in this, in this text, and then we're going to let James apply some things to our life 
again. Write it down. Here's, the big, what, here's what the big deal is. Number one, favoritism affects how you see. Sometimes it's not about what you see, but how you see it. Sometimes it's not about what you're seeing, but how you are interpreting what you're seeing. See, some of us are not looking at things the way God looks at things. And this is important to James. Whether, whether it's how we're looking at our trials in chapter one, how we're looking at our temptations, what God is doing and what God is not doing, how we're looking at God's word, or how here now he turns to, how we are looking at people. This is important to God. It's important to James. It's why he's writing it. How you see things is important. Favoritism puts a superficial filter on our life. It robs our life of all meaning and depth and value and significance. And all of our relationships will be as shallow as our vision. Void. Void of anything real and powerful and meaningful. That's what the big deal. It affects how we see. Let's pick it up in verse one. James chapter two, verse one. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. One translation, it says, the Lord of glory. Believers in the Lord of glory. And the Hebrew, like the Hebrew word for like the synonymous word for gr- the glory in here is Shekinah. Have you ever heard of the Shekinah glory? It's the the visible manifestation of the divine presence of God, okay? And so James is is doing something here. He's going, look, if if you believe in the Lord of Shekinah, if you believe in in the Lord of glory, Jesus, the visible manifestation of the divine presence of God, then why are you judging people by their outward appearance? If, you, if Jesus is the visible manifestation who did not come in, in, in a manner that was esteemed or highly but emptied himself of all divinity, took on the form of humility as a man, if, if he, the Lord of glory, of Shekinah, the visible manifestation, came in humble means, then what are you doing looking at superficial things to draw conclusions? Come on, somebody say amen right there. Are you seeing that? Suppose a man comes into your, and then he gets really practical. Well, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man, he says, a filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, have you, he says, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Favoritism affects how you see. See what? What James is pointing out is that that the person with favoritism in their heart is looking at the ring and the clothing. The the ring, it represents wealth and status. Ring and and fine clothing, the rings in, in that time always represented a status, the name, where they come from. But these people, James goes on to, to say, if you read it, these people, James says, aren't these the people that are throwing you into prison, that are falsely accusing you, that are betraying you? See, here's what he's saying. Favoritism will cause you to treat people who hurt you better than the people who actually care about you. Well, I'm going to come back to that because that's what's really important about how you're seeing things and how you're making judgments and assessments. Favoritism will cause you to treat people who are hurting you better than people who actually care about you. James chapter 2, verse 1, in another version of translation says, if you have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, then you won't treat some people better than others. You will not, you will not have different standards for different, and this is a common social disease. This is a human nature disease that every single one of us have to one degree or another, and we need to just kind of identify. We need, in order to I, avoid it, you got to identify where it shows up. So here's what James, James pulls out a few, like where it shows up, but let's dig into it a little bit. Here's a few ways that favoritism can show up in our life. The first way he tells us is by appearances, is by appearances. Favoritism based on appearance. And are we have a world that's infatuated with our appearance that, that today beauty is everything and beauty is what you are told is beautiful. And so we judge things based upon an appearance that the world has created a standard for us, whether it's good or bad or attractive or not attractive or healthy or unhealthy. And so we make judgments based upon appearances. Do you, do you judge based on 
Do you look, look at people and make an assessment based upon their physical appearance? That's favoritism. Or here's another one, ancestry. James just said the ring, well, he had a family name, this guy did. Like the ancestry, your race, your nationality, your ethnic background. We see this still happening today. Favoritism and prejudice and partiality based upon how somebody looks externally, the color of their skin, what language they speak. If they speak my language, then I'm going to treat them better. But James says, those who believe and have faith in the Lord of glory will not treat people better than others. So, so this, this is easy to fall into, isn't it? It's easy. If you look like me and talk like me, I'm just going to kind of lean that way just a little bit. Ancestry. Or, or if you don't, then I'm not going to lean that way. Even favoring your own family. Uh, like in business, that's called nepotism. Favoritism towards, I don't know like what workplaces, but sometimes in small businesses, you got, you got promotions given to the, the job positions. Everyone's in the family. All the hierarchy of it is all the family. That's favoritism based on ancestry. And James says, mm, that can't happen in God's house. Okay, here's, here's another one. I'm just trying to point out the way so we identify it so it doesn't show up. Favoritism based on age. All right, often people will accept you or reject you based upon how old you are. Are you too old? Are you too young? Um, you know, when I first started Discovery Church, I got, I got judged really hard on my, my youth. Not, yet, not old enough. I'm not old enough to start a church. Now I got grace coming in. I'm too old to hand off the reins now, pastor. Just started this thing, dude. Here's another one. How about achievement? I'm just trying to expose some areas where favoritism can show up. Achievement. We have a culture obsessed with success. We, we, and, and, and not just success, but we have this celebrity conscious culture, and it can even find its way into the church where we're looking at those people who have achievement and status and giving them more of our attention, more of our, our time. Here's the last one, affluence. And this is what kind of James points out. The most common distinction in the classes of James' time is your economic status. You may want to put that. Affluence is economic status. How much money you make? What kind of car you drive? What side of town you live on? You know, what you, how big is your home? Let me ask you a question. Like, so this, how do you treat people that make more money than you? And how do you treat people that make less money than you? All right. James is just trying, he's using an example to try and point out how we're not practicing this royal law, this, this importance of how we see people and how we, how we treat people. People, the Bible tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. All right, God, God does not show favoritism. God is saying the measuring systems of this world, the gov what, what governs the relationships and the hierarchy of this world cannot govern my people. Look, if you're going to be God's people, then you need to learn how to look from the inside out rather than outside in. We have to look different. We have to see Different. So how does God see? How does God see? First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider that outward stuff. Don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look. The Lord does not look at the things you and I look at. The things that you and I get caught up on are the outward stuff. But God looks inside out. So the, listen, the Lord does not look at that outward stuff. Can you, how would your life be different if you did not look at outward appearance? That if you did not make conclusion, assessment, that you did not draw anything from outside in rather than inside out. Out. God wants us to live different, to see different, to walk different. I want to see what God sees. I don't know about you. I want to see what God sees. I want to see how God sees. You know, you know what God sees? What God sees is bigger. 
God's got a bigger picture and a bigger vision. Than, I want to see God's big picture, but how God sees is deeper. I want to see what God sees. I want to see how God sees. This is a hard lesson for the early church as they started going from a Judaic Jewish movement to a worldwide movement. We see in Acts chapter 10, just a little side note here on our study of James, just to show you how hard this is. Peter, the apostle Peter, who walked with Jesus, heard Jesus teaching, the, even Jesus healing people that weren't even of, of Jewish descent. Uh, here, he walked with Jesus, lived and even been preaching and teaching and doing signs and wonders and miracles. One day, you can read it, I didn't put it in your notes, but in Acts chapter 10, one day Jesus was praying, or Peter was praying, and the Lord gives him a vision of this blanket coming down from heaven, and all manner of animals were in this blanket, falling and getting trapped. All manners of animals, birds, and reptiles, so unclean animals, according to Jewish law, were being dropped in a blanket into his lap. And, and he's, he's, he heard a voice from heaven, and God tells him, get up and eat. And Peter tells God, no, I will not eat. My lips have never touched anything impure or unclean. It's against the law for me to touch some of that stuff up there. God, that's unclean. Stop. And God tells Peter, do not call impure what I have made clean. And then moments later, he gets this visitor and says, hey, Cornelius, this Roman Italian centurion, is got, you know, he's calling for you. He got a vision from God. And, and so this was just preparation in Peter's life. God was showing him before because he would have rejected that because it was not lawful for any Jew to go into a Gentile home. But because of the vision, he says, okay, I better go. God's, God's doing something. Here he goes in that home. Cornelius has got his whole bunch of people in there that just gave their life to Jesus. He asks them if they've received the Holy Spirit. He prays for them. They all get baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and then Peter says, Peter says this. He, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. After so many years of walking with Jesus and being used by Jesus, he barely gets it now. Years, years later, some of you may need to have this kind of moment with God today where he changes how you see. Because the assessments that you are making about people, they're not, it's just not how God sees. And that's what's the big deal of favoritism. Favoritism affects how you see. Here's the second distinction. Favoritism rearranges the seats. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by the seats? Okay, some people are in the wrong placement in your life. Some people are in the wrong seat in your organization. Some people are in the wrong proximity, in the wrong place. You got some friends in the wrong place in your life, on your team, in your business, in your church. Like what? You got some people in the wrong seats. James chapter 2, he continues. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a what? Here's a good seat. Now, in this context, this is church meeting. Here's a good seat for you because you look the part. <laughs> Here, I want you to sit right here. Here's a special seat for you. But say to the poor man, you go stand over there. There's not a seat for you. Actually, sit down over here by you know, my, my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil Thoughts, he says, whether it's your business, your team, or your friendships, there are, only, there are only so many seats in your life. There are only, there are only so, you only have so much time to give of yourself. You only have so many friends before it starts getting superficial. Are you hearing me, you guys? If you own a business, some of your business, you only have so many open positions on payroll. If you lead a team, there's only so many roles that you can have people do. There are only so many seats. Let me give you some keys to success. Three keys, not in your notes. If, you want, if you're a leader in here, you lead a team, a business organization, anything like that, let me give you three keys to success real quick. Because favoritism, it rearranges the seats. And it affects the effectiveness of your team, of your organization, of your relationships. It'll, it'll affect, the, James is saying, it's going to affect the church if you don't get this right, guys. It's going to affect how we do life together and accomplish the mission together. Three keys to success. Get the right people at the table. 
get the right people at the table, all right? If you, if you have favoritism, prejudice, or partiality, you're not seeing right to get the right people at the, at the table. And here's the second key. Get the right people in the right seat at the table. So that's based upon something inside. That's based upon their gifts and attributes and their qualities. They got to be sitting there. They could be at the table on the team, but in the wrong position. You got to get them in the right seat. And favoritism rearranges the seats. It's going to mess you up. For some of you, it's messing up your team. Some of you, it's messing up your business. Here's, here's the third key. Get the wrong people out of the table. I'm going to give them to you again. Get the right people at the table. Get the right people in the right seat at the table and get the wrong people out of the table. Favoritism rearranges the seats. The Bible gives us an example of this in a church setting. Not in your notes, but 1 Samuel chapter 2. Let me give it to you. Eli, the priest, had a situation, a problem, where he had the wrong people in the wrong seat. He was showing favoritism toward his family. Actually, it was his kids. He was showing favoritism towards. Let me show it to you in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now, Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing. They were actually extorting the people and, 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 and treating the holy things of God with such disgrace. It was terrible. And how they actually slept with the women who served at the entrance of the temple, of the tent meeting. They're doing terrible. And everybody knew it. It continues. So he said to them, why do you do such things? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke. See, favoritism will cause you to treat people who are hurting your organization better than people who can actually help your organization. This is what it says later in chapter 3. God says, For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Favoritism will cause you to treat people better who are hurting your team, your family, your life, your organization. You're treating them better than the people that can actually help you. You're seeing things. You're showing favor to the wrong people. You know there's a difference. Hey, there's a difference between favor and favoritism. I need to help some of you out with this, okay? Because there's a big difference between favor and Favoritism is preferential treatment based on superficial matters. Favor is the position someone receives based on their merit, morality, or maturity. Okay, so John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says this, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Here's how another translation says it. Look beneath the surface so that you can judge correctly correctly. Like, like you're given favor for the wrong reasons, and that's, that's called favoritism. You need to look inside, look deeper. See, God doesn't show favoritism, but he does show favor. Are you hearing me? Okay. God doesn't show favoritism, but he does show favor. This is going to mess up some of you with a victim mentality up, okay? Because it is possible that some of you think your parents showed favoritism towards your sibling. It is possible that some of you here think that your boss was showing favoritism towards your coworkers, but actually what they were doing was showing favor based on their merit, morality, or maturity. And while your sibling may have got better grades and sucked up, and you didn't play those games, you know what I mean? And that coworker of yours, you know, just a suck up and goes above and beyond and stuff like that, and you don't play those games, look, um, the cycle will always continue. Yeah. It'll continue and always continue until you take ownership of your attitude and actions. Okay? There's a difference between favor and favoritism. I, I don't believe that statistic, 15%. Only 15% of kids didn't, weren't affected by favoritism. I think there's a large percentage of those 85% of us that just have victimhood mentality. Okay, whether it's in the job, the workplace, in, in the churches that you keep leaving and crying about, that's, until you take ownership of your own attitude and your actions, favor is given by merit, by morality, by maturity. But wait a second, that's not how Jesus judges me. But aren't you thankful that, that, that Jesus is, gives us grace, that it's an unmerited 
favor, that there is, like, I didn't deserve this freedom and this eternal life and this forgiveness, but he gives it. How many are you thankful for the grace of God, that we don't have to deserve it, you didn't have to earn it at all? I am. But just because you have the grace of God doesn't mean you have the favor of God. Oh, I'm just trying to help you guys out and preparing you for next week because next week James is about to hit you upside the head. I'm trying to help you out, okay, and, and have you see the difference here between God's grace, you have eternal life, you have forgiveness, you have freedom. It is unmerited, but just because you have grace doesn't mean you have favor. This is what God says about grace. All over the Bible, it talks about what God favors. Isaiah gives one example. These are the ones God says, I look at with favor. Those who are humble. You know, humble means it's, it's you're not thinking better of yourself than others. Those who are humble, who are contrite in spirit, and who tremble at my word. They love my word. They honor my word. They tremble at my word. You know, you are even told, like, you can seek the favor of God. You should. Jehoaz was actually so, and it says that he sought the Lord's favor, and the Lord listened to him. You need to give favor to the right people based on inner qualities, not external qualities. Favoritism not only affects how you see, but favoritism is going to rearrange the seats in your life. Here's the third thing. Favoritism, you guys, is a serious sin, James says. This is a big deal. It's not, I understand. Favoritism seems like a small sin, that like you can overlook it. Eh, it's just one of those small things and easy to overlook. It's not one of the serious ones. Look what James says in verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking how much of it? How many laws must I break to become a lawbreaker? Okay, how many crimes must I commit before I'm a criminal? Okay, this is what, this is what James is saying. I, I was at uh, Rocket Fizz. I don't know if you guys have ever been there. It's this cool place, and my kids love Rocket Fizz. There's, there's all kinds of bottles, glass bottles of soda on the ground, and, uh, like all low to the ground and stuff. And we were there, and we're shopping, and one kid actually accidentally hit the bottle. Of course, it was going to happen, man. They're all over the place, and just it's spilled everywhere. How much do you think that costs? The price of the bottle. They said, she went over and said, that's okay, it's okay. That'll be $2.50. She didn't look at it and go, how broken is this? She didn't look at it and go, okay, uh, what parts of the bottle were broken? No, no, it didn't matter what parts of the bottle, bottle were broken. Because it was broken, you owe me $2.50. That's how much the bottle costs. So what James has given us an example here that, that it did, Look, this isn't, it's not small. This is, this is, this, this is a lot. You, you falter at one point, you're faltering at all. He gives an example for he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not mur murder. So he says, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you still become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by that, that law that gives freedom, the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful, because mercy triumphs over judgment. So he starts to turn the attention towards our heart posture towards people. Here, let me give you this truth. Where they are seated should not determine how they're, how they're treated. Okay, you can give favor to some people, and you should. You absolutely should. You should be careful on who's your friend and who you're spending time with. If you're a leader, you should show favor towards people with the merit, morality, and maturity and give the seat to the person who deserves it and, and who God has appointed. You should. But, but where they're seated should not determine how they're treated. You should not treat people that are seated at the table different from people that aren't at the table. You shouldn't treat people who are in the walls different from people who are outside of your walls. So how do we treat people then? How should we treat people? Let's get really practical and take some advice from James today. Four things. Number one, accept everybody. Accept everybody. Every, have you ever been to a church of spiritual snobs? Anyone? Anyone ever been rejected at church? Felt like you don't, didn't belong there? The problem is I think people confuse acceptance with approval. Okay, you can accept people without approving of everything they do. There's a big difference. We're to accept everybody. We're not to approve of everything they do. So no matter what they do and, you know, uh, how they behave or what they do with their time, we still love them. 
You can accept everybody. You're to accept them. It doesn't mean you approve of what they do. God loves you, but he doesn't approve of everything you do. Okay? Love is not saying I approve of everything you do. Love is saying I accept you in spite of what you do. That's what love says. Romans 15 and 17 actually tells us very plainly, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. So at Discovery, we work hard at having an attitude of acceptance. You are loved here. We say, welcome home, right on the bulletin. This, this, welcome home, man. We work hard at creating a friendly, welcoming atmosphere. You are welcome here, whether you shop at Neiman Marcus or Wally Martis. I don't care where are you, whether you got a PhD or you're still working on your GED, whether you're not married or you've been married five times, like you are, you are accepted here. Whether, no matter how you behave or what you believe, like no matter what your lifestyle choices are, I don't have to agree with all of your choices to love you the way Jesus loves me. And so we work really hard at accepting everybody here because the church is a hospital for the hurting, not a sanctuary for saints. This is not, don't call this place a sanctuary, please, please. Don't use that terminology here. There's ain't nothing holy about this place except for the presence of God. That's it. That's it. But the presence of God can be anywhere, and he also cannot be anywhere as well. Some churches that some people can't get into. I heard a story. This black guy tried to go into a church. He was out of town, and he was trying to just go, took his family to a church, but it was a white church. It was in the East Coast. And, and so they said, no, and gave him like, ah, you should pray about coming in here, that kind of thing. They said, literally, you should pray about coming in here. There are more churches for you on the other side of town. And this guy was brokenhearted about it, went and prayed about it. And he said that, that, that he felt the Lord tell him, don't worry about that. I've been trying to get in for 20 years. <laughs> okay. Accept, accept everybody. Okay. Accept everybody. Love everybody. Number two, what do we do? How do we treat people, Jay? How do we treat people, God? Value everybody. Show value to every person. Galatians 3. 28 actually tells us that there is no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer a class distinction here. There's no longer slave or free. Look at this. There's no longer male or female before any movement of modern day feminism or anything like that. There was the Bible thousands of years ago. There was Jesus leveling the playing field thousands of years ago that said, no, 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 no. It's not, it's, you're not greater or lesser. There is no longer, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so we value every person, no matter your background, no matter your, your gender, no matter. Like, like you can, God, and we do believe here at Discovery that you can be called, appointed, minister, preach, no matter what, like you, you're, you're male or female. And it might be different from some of your backgrounds, but if you want to explain to me how you reconcile this verse with your belief that women have to not have certain roles in the church, then you come and, come and talk to me. Actually, I'll post something online about women in church later, okay? There's a lot of confusion about women in leadership and women in church, you guys. There really is. That's one of the favoritism that we've seen throughout our generation. And, and it, I'm not a feminist. Don't get me wrong. I think feminist movement is, is, is very destructive in a lot of ways, okay? Yeah, I said it. But I think that, that God, his word, is, is not destructive. It is, it is healing. It is healing, you guys. Um, I'll post something. There's a lot of, there's a, I'm not going to get into it because I'm already running a lot of time, but well, there's a lot of mishandling of the Word of God in some portions of the Word of God in what is said about it in, follow me on social media. I'll, I'll give you something, okay? <laughs> First Peter chapter 2, verse 7 says, show proper respect to who? Everyone. To everyone. Look, not those who deserved your respect, all right? The standard of the world says that the value of the individual can be diminished by their beliefs or behaviors. That's the standard of the world. If they behave a certain way, then, then, then this, this is why so many people commit terrible acts of violence. They justify acts of violence because of how people believe or how people behave. They diminish the value. And not just like the destructive acts of violence that are committed. Listen, the small acts of violence that are committed as well. It's also the reason why you trash somebody behind their back and diminish their reputation and character behind their back because of the way they believe or behaved. You justified yourself by maligning somebody's character behind their back. 
Why? Because you didn't value them. You treated them different and you felt justified in treating that person different because of how they behaved. And God says, if you're to be in my family, you are not to have the standards of the world. You're not to show favoritism and treat people different from other people. You're to accept everybody. You're to value everybody. Number three, you're to serve everybody. Serve everybody. Not just certain people get your attention, get your service. There's two truths about serving. I believe everybody can serve. Everybody can serve. And the second truth, everybody can serve anybody. There is no reason why anyone here shouldn't be a servant. Everybody. Sometimes I get people like, you know, maybe you're too affluent for it. You're, you got degrees, too many degrees for it. And they're like, well, pastor, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to be first impressions. You know, I've been a leader at church before when I was a, you should be a pastor. I'm like, great, get in the door. Here's a door. Here's a bulletin. Okay. I'm oh, pastor, but I'm, you know, you know, I run this organization and this team. And uh, what you got for me? I got servanthood. That's what I got for you. That's what I got. That's what I got. Okay. And there ain't nothing else for you until you get that. You can, you can, have, you can have more of that. You can have, there's more, sure, but you start right here. Accept everybody. Value everybody. Serve everybody. And then number four. Number four. I got to be quick. Number four. Forgive everybody. Okay. Forgiveness doesn't mean favor. Forgiveness doesn't mean favor. What forgiveness does, though, listen, it levels the playing field again so that I can see correctly. Because when I'm harboring offense and bitterness in my heart, I'm not seeing correctly. I'm not seeing right. And that bitterness and that offense in your heart is going to rearrange the seats in your life. It's going to keep out what God wants in in your life. Favor, forgiveness is in favor. But it's, it's serious, James says, right? Here's, here's what Jesus says about it, Matthew chapter 6. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't show mercy, James says, you will not be given mercy. If you don't, Jesus says, if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you of your sins. The church that accepts, values, serves, and forgives people is the church that God blesses. There is nothing that can stop a church that is unified by love. But it takes hard work, doesn't it? It doesn't happen accidentally. It takes work to, to, to shed off the filters of this world and the stuff of this world and stop being conformed to the image of our culture and stop seeing things from outside in and start seeing how God sees from inside, inside out. Can I pray for you, church? Come on, bow your heads all over this place. Close your eyes with me today. I, I believe some of you are here today and maybe the way that you have even seen yourself has not been the way God sees you. And God does see something so valuable. He sees his child. He sees his beloved. He sees a son and a daughter. But maybe right now you are far away from where God wants you to be. And today I want to give you an opportunity to come home. I come home. This is where you belong. You belong with him. Some of you sense that, you know that. And the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart. Some of you have never even made a decision to come home to God. Others of you need to make it again, though. You've made it before, but you need to do it again. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. You're one prayer away from a fresh start, new beginning, from transformation to begin right now in your life. If that's you and you're ready, for whether it's the first time or, the, or you're doing it again to give Jesus control of your life, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but right there where you're seated, I want to pray for you. If you're watching online, I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I want you to type in, I need Jesus. If you're here in the house, on the count of three, I just want you to lift up your hand and lift it high if you're ready for a fresh start. Come on, that's why you're here. One, two, three. I need Jesus today. I need a fresh start. Come on. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Amen. I need Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yes. All over this place, all over here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. Back there too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Back there, way in the back. Yep. Over here too. Yeah. Thank you, God. Right there. Yep. All over this place. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray something like this with me? I want you to whisper it. Say, Jesus. 
forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for wandering so far. Today I'm coming home. I surrender the control of my life to you and I make you my Lord, my Savior and my God. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. God, I pray over your people that we would be different, that we would live different, that we would see different, that we would not use systems of this world, hierarchy of this world, that we would not be fooled in seeing things not how you see them, God. Help us to see from the inside out rather than the outside in. There are friends in our life that need to be rearranged, teams, organizations, time that we spend. God, help us to shed off the prejudice, the partiality, favoritism. God, forgive us for calling those things that are clean and pure. We're calling them any different. God, will you unify us in love? May this be a church marked by your love, marked by friendliness, marked by acceptance. May we treat people the way you treat us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen. Amen.